Hello and welcome to another teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is still true and directly related to our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. It is often understood that Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement, is considered a day of fasting. But is this simply tradition, or is it a commandment? In the Jerusalem Talmud, the Jewish Oral Law, Yom Kippur is referred to as the Soma Rabbah, the Great Fast, and in another place simply as Soma, Fast. We even see in Acts 27 verse 9, a day referred to as the Fast, which was likely referring to Yom Kippur. However, was the fast associated with Yom Kippur merely one of many traditions and not commanded in the Torah? Or is a fast commanded on Yom Kippur? The Hebrew word for fast is tsum. It means to refrain from eating for a period of time. This could include any drink as well. However, the Torah does not specifically call us to fast on Yom Kippur, but to anah ourselves. In Leviticus 16.29, 23.27, in Numbers 29.7, the word anah is used, which refers to a, a humbling or mortifying or afflicting one's soul. The Hebrew word for fast, tsum, is not used as it relates to Yom Kippur. Why? The Hebrew word anah in the context of Yom Kippur has been interpreted as including, in addition to fasting, refraining from bathing, anointing, wearing leather shoes, and sexual relations. These are forbidden only by rabbinic legislation and not by specific instructions found in the Torah. We know what it means to fast, but what does it really mean to afflict ourselves? The Hebrew word ana appears about 79 times in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. We can find the first occurrence in Genesis 15, verse 13. Then Yahweh said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there and will be afflicted, ana for 400 years. Here we see how being afflicted is synonymous with being a servant or placed under the authority of another. In this light, it is not very positive because it is unwillful bondage. It is not by their own desire that they become a servant, but the circumstances outside of their control, not of their own free will. The next instance of the word is similar, Genesis chapter 16, verse 6. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly, Anna, with her, and she fled from her. Again, under the authority of another. In this illustration, the master has the right to reward or punish the servant. Exodus chapter 10. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble Anna yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Again, another use meaning to place oneself under the authority of another. It can also be used in the context of a marriage related to vows and binding. Keep this in mind for later in the teaching. Numbers chapter 30 verse 13. Any vow and any binding oath to afflict herself her husband may establish, or her husband may make void. Our Creator uses the word with us, meaning to humble us or to make us low. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you, to do you good in the end? This is a test as to whether we will follow his instructions or not, his Torah. For example, Psalm 119 verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 75. I know, Yahweh, that your rules are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. See how humbling ourselves is directly correlated with following his instructions? To anas something is a response to authority. In these instances, ana is positive and it is us willfully placing ourselves under the authority of our Creator. 
This is why the Torah does not focus or really even mention fasting as it relates to Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is designed to encourage us and call us to humble ourselves, to make ourselves low before Him in obedience to Him. We are to cease work and meditate and focus on His authority. Meaning this, though it is always important to follow Him and be obedient, it is most important to be sure that we are following His authority on Yom Kippur. Because of this, many believe that Yom Kippur will be the last day to repent and appeal at the time of the beginning of the day of the Lord. So on Yom Kippur, it is of utmost importance to focus on Him and His ways, to humble ourselves, to prostrate ourselves, to make ourselves low, to only be following His instructions and not our own ways. Now here is the question. If we are to afflict ourselves on Yom Kippur, is there a particular type of obedience that our Creator brings to our attention on this day? In other words, does Yahweh define for us the manner of affliction that He expects from us? We already mentioned that Yahweh makes no mention of fasting as it relates to Yom Kippur. But He does mention another type of obedience related to the affliction several times. Watch how many times He tells us that we should rest and that this particular point in time, Moedim, is a Sabbath. Leviticus 23. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to Yahweh. Okay, so we should afflict ourselves. What does that mean? And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before Yahweh, your Elohim. So in continuing in that same line of thought, it says as follows, For whoever is not afflicted, Anna, on that very day, shall be cut off from his people. Do you see how working or not working on Yom Kippur is related to being afflicted or not afflicted? In case we miss it, Yahweh continues to say it again in verse 30. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. That's the second time. So again, being afflicted, a na, is being related to not working, a Sabbath. But in case we missed it two times, Yahweh says it again in verse 31. You shall not do any work is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. And in case we missed it three times, Yahweh says it again for a fourth time in verse 32. Afflicting yourself on Yom Kippur is related to resting on the Sabbath. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, shall you keep your Sabbath. So the affliction that Yahweh desires from us on Yom Kippur is a day of rest and self-reflection, not necessarily fasting. We cannot humble ourselves by meditating on His authority if we're negating His authority by consuming ourselves with work and focusing on ourselves. That should only make sense, and that is why Yahweh highlights the first part of what it means to Ana on Yom Kippur, which is to cease, to stop. After we cease and stop, we can humble ourselves by meditating on His ways, repent where we need to repent, and do some serious introspection on where we are aligned or not aligned with His Torah. Have you considered the calendric placement of Yom Kippur as it relates to what we are to be doing on that day and why? Yom Kippur is sandwiched between the Feast of the Awakening Blast, Yom Teruah, and the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot. What lies between the sound to awaken and our dwelling in booths is a time to self-reflect and focus on our disobedience and rebellion as a body. We are to rest, meditate, and focus. We are to be humbled by His authority and ensure that we are operating under His authority 100%. Our meditation and solemn self-reflection on our walk with Yahweh is concentrated in the Hebrew word ana, translated as affliction and humbled. Connect Leviticus 23.27 to Matthew 23.12. Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, 
and you shall afflict, humble yourselves, and present a food offering to Yahweh. Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The etymology of anah means to respond or react to someone or something. Hence, it is also translated as to answer or to respond. Genesis 18. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to Yahweh, I who am but dust and ashes. Do you see there how when he responded, he was recognizing Yahweh's authority and he was humbling himself by realizing his position under that authority? There are a number of translations of this word in both the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. To answer is to respond to a particular condition or stimulus. The idea of afflicting your souls is to stop and give an account of oneself. Paul admonishes us to examine ourselves in 1 Corinthians 13.5. It is a time of retrospection. As we mentioned, traditionally this word has been tied to fasting during Yom Kippur. Fasting is infrequently tied to affliction, but that's not what the word really means. While fasting is a type of affliction, while infrequently noted in Scripture, it is not the only type of affliction or the type of affliction that we need to focus on. We see Yahweh calling our attention to this in Isaiah 58, as fasting slowly became the focus of affliction for Yom Kippur. Isaiah 58. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight, and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? See how he's calling it back to a humbling, to prostrate ourselves. It is to bow down his head like a reed, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to Yahweh? Is this not the fast I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Fasting is not a time of self-analysis and reflection, but rather a time to get up and loose bands, undo burdens, and break yokes. Obviously, there is nothing wrong with fasting during this time of year, as long as one is about the business of afflicting their souls. As a side note, one of the gradational variants of this word is anon, which is translated as clouds. When water vapors rise from the earth and begin to cool, the response or result is a cloud. Clouds are a response to rising water molecules. A cognate of this word is anai, or the poor. Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One who is wise and humble enough to really look at himself and see a need for his Savior and someone greater than himself is truly afflicting his soul. Jonah chapter 3 verse 7 and Nehemia chapter 9 verses 1 through 3 both mention fasting, but not in the context of humbling or affliction. Make no mistake though, fasting can be a type of affliction, or really lead into it. Psalm 35, verse 13. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. But not all affliction is fasting. Fasting can humble us by forcing us to be constantly reminded of our own mortality, and thus in need for a savior from our promised end, death. So it is not that one cannot fast on Yom Kippur. We would simply urge those in the faith to realize that Yom Kippur is not so much about fasting, if it is about fasting at all, but about obeying our Creator, about humbling ourselves and making sure that we rest on that very important day. Some like to point out Isaiah 58 to further illustrate this problem. It makes no sense to fast on the Yom Kippur Sabbath, yet cause others to work. It is missing the whole point of this very important day. Isaiah 58. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Yahweh states that they were seeking their own pleasure and making others work for them, despite their fasting. 
Yet they were confused as to why Yahweh did not recognize their fasting. They missed the whole point. The whole point of it all is to humble yourself in obedience. They should not have been making others work for them on that particular day. Yahweh, of course, answers. Isaiah 58. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to Yahweh? In verses 13 through 14. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, which was defined as others working for you earlier, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of Yahweh honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in Yahweh, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. So, in conclusion, though we can fast on Yom Kippur, and though fasting is a form of affliction, it does not appear to be the form of affliction that our Creator desires for us to focus on. The important matters of Yom Kippur seem to be focusing on repenting and humbling, and leading to full obedience, centered around afflicting ourselves in a Sabbath rest. Many realize that Isaiah 58 is about Yom Kippur. They will quote Isaiah 58 and say, See? Yom Kippur is all about fasting. What is both a little sad and a little comical is that they are making the same mistake that Isaiah 58 is trying to correct. Isaiah 58.3 clearly reveals that it was interpreted by the Jews that they should fast on Yom Kippur. That is the way that they chose to understand what it means to afflict themselves. And that is what many do today. But Yahweh corrects them in their limited understanding. He gives them the actual meaning of what it means to afflict ourselves on Yom Kippur if we just keep reading. Pay particular attention to verses 7 and 10. Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Yahweh shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and Yahweh will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. Do you see how Yahweh corrects their understanding of what it means to afflict ourselves on Yom Kippur? Yes, verse 3 does indeed show that the Jews did interpret afflicting ourselves on Yom Kippur to be about fasting. But if we keep reading, Yahweh offers clarification on what it really means to afflict ourselves. Yahweh clarifies the Torah for us. Within that clarification, Yahweh even mentions hungry people twice, even going as far to say to feed them with bread. If fasting is so important on Yom Kippur, why is Yahweh saying to feed people with bread on this day? Feed people on the annual fast day? It is almost as though Yahweh is mocking them in their limited understanding of what it means to afflict yourself, especially as it relates to Yahweh's intent on Yom Kippur. Every year, those in Hebrew roots erupt into arguing on this subject. Many do not like this teaching. In a continued dose of irony found in Isaiah 58, that is also covered. Astoundingly, it is found right after verse 3, the verse many like to quote about Yom Kippur and fasting. Why have we fasted and you see it not? We have humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it. Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. So, as verse 10 says, take away the pointing finger and speaking wickedness. Go feed the hungry on Yom Kippur. Invite the homeless in. If you're making Yom Kippur to be about a fast, you're missing the point according to Yahweh. 
And if you are arguing such interpretations with others about it, you're doing exactly what Isaiah 58 says not to do. Does that mean we shouldn't fast? No, that is not what we are saying. As we said earlier, it is okay to fast. But don't make that your obedience to Yom Kippur as your focus on how to afflict yourself. Personally, our family does fast on Yom Kippur. We believe it to be a good tradition, but only when it is used in a good way. Do not make the same mistake those in Isaiah 58 did. Some point to Jeremiah 36 as support for Yom Kippur being a day of fasting. Let's read. So you are to go, and on a day of fasting, in the hearing of all the people in Yahweh's house, you shall read the words of Yahweh from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. You shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their cities. Jeremiah instructed Baruch to read the word of Yahweh to the people on the day of the fast. Many, quick to try to find any support for a fast to be commanded on Yom Kippur, immediately say, See, here is a fast, and this fast must be Yom Kippur. This is said while ignoring any prophet that adds to the Torah, according to Deuteronomy 13, is a false prophet. So since the Torah does not declare a fast on Yom Kippur, if Jeremiah is stating such, then he is adding to the Torah. Thankfully, Jeremiah is not a false prophet. If we simply continue reading, we find that the fast occurred on the ninth month, not on the tenth day of the seventh month, or Yom Kippur. Let's read verses 9 through 10. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before Yahweh. Then, in the hearing of all the people, Baruch read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the house of Yahweh, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the secretary, which was in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of Yahweh's house. The ninth month is clearly not the seventh month, so we cannot say that this is about a fast for Yom Kippur. Then we have Zechariah chapter 7 verse 5, and it does mention a fast in the seventh month. So again, some immediately say, see, here is a fast in the seventh month, and this fast must be Yom Kippur. So again, Zechariah cannot be adding to the Torah for the same reasons we already outlined in Jeremiah. Then the word of Yahweh of hosts came to me, Say to all the people of the land and the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh, and for these seventy years was it for me that you fasted? So this verse also mentions a fast in the fifth month. Is there a fast commanded in the Torah on the fifth month? No. So Zechariah is pointing to a tradition of fasting in the fifth and seventh month that occurred for 70 years. The fast in the seventh month is no more of a commanded fast than the fast Zechariah mentions in the fifth month. Suffice it to say that Zechariah does not even state that the seventh month fast was on the tenth day. So clearly, there are several problems here. We cannot say that Zechariah was referring to the tenth day of the seventh month without adding to what is written. We also see that Zechariah references the fifth month as a fast which no one is suggesting that is commanded in the Torah. So how can we say then that the seventh month fast mentioned in the same context is one that is commanded in the Torah? We can't. Then we have Joel chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room, and the bride her chamber. These two verses certainly mention a fast in the context of the future day of the Lord. This is a day that Yeshua returns and unleashes judgment on the earth. Note that it says to consecrate a fast. If fasting was already consecrated to occur on Yom Kippur, we would not need to consecrate again a new fast. That might seem like a small point, but it is important. The phrase, consecrate a fast, was chosen for a reason. Furthermore, on which of the Moedim are we commanded to blow a trumpet? Is it Yom Kippur? No, it is the Day of Trumpets. When we see other verses about the return of Yeshua on the Day of the Lord, it is the blowing of trumpets that is emphasized. So, Joel chapter 2 could easily be a fast that is occurring on the Day of Trumpets. 
we need to be careful that we do not read into the text and definitively declare more than what is written. Consider another calendric connection. The spring Moedim and the fall Moedim share similar dates. The mirror image of the first day of the month of the year is Yom Teruah, or the Day of Trumpets, just six months later. The fifteenth day of the first month starts the Feast of Eleven Bread. Just six months later starts the Feast of Sukkot. What do we have in the middle? On the tenth day of the first month, the Passover lamb is to be tested. Six months later, we see that the tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur, the day that we are tested, a day that we are to make sure that we are afflicting ourselves, being under Yahweh's authority. Remember how we stated that affliction is connected to testing. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble or annoy you and test you to do you good in the end? So in this, we certainly recognize that fasting is a means to afflict ourselves on Yom Kippur. And it is a traditional means of affliction that is associated with Yom Kippur in both the prophets and the Brit Hadashah. Is it the only type of affliction? No, it is not even really the type of affliction Yahweh is really concerned with. That is why Yahweh never even details fasting on Yom Kippur in the Torah. He clarifies what he wants in Isaiah 58. He wants us to humble ourselves before him in obedience. He wants us to afflict ourselves by placing other people's needs before our own needs. That is true fasting, when we give up serving ourselves in order to serve others. That is what the Day of Atonement is all about. We serve Yahweh and place Him before all of our needs. We humble ourselves under Him. We repent and follow Him. On this day of fasting, we give bread to the hungry and we invite in the homeless. We give up what our flesh needs to serve others. We sacrifice so others may be blessed. Yes, we can fast as a form of affliction but it means nothing without observing what Yahweh really means in terms of afflicting ourselves. We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high-quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.